In book 13 of Ovid's Metamorphoses, we get the hilarious story that ensues when the Cyclops falls in love with Galatea, a sea nymph who already has a lover of her own named Asus, and the one-eyed monster Polyphemus composes a love song for her, which he sings out from a promontory at such a pitch that he is heard by the nymph herself as she lays in the arms of her lover. Now, regarding love songs in general, the philosopher Socrates advises against them. Anyone who deals wisely in love matters, he says, does not praise his beloved until he prevails. And if this is so, the Cyclops is all the more ridiculous for he praises his beloved when she belongs to someone else. And to boot, he is not a handsome fella. Ovid writes that he was such a barbaric creature, even the woods were appalled by his presence. And yet he is infatuated with Galatea, who tells the story herself. Galatea narrates that he, as in the Cyclops, discovered the meaning of love and neglected his flocks and his cave when the flames of his violent passion were raging inside him. Now, in his longing to please me, he bothered about his appearance. The wild Polyphemus was combing his prickly locks with a mattock, attempting to trim his shaggy beard with a pruning hook, and trying to look less fierce when he gazed at his face in a pool. Now this Polyphemus trying to comb his awful hair is the same Cyclops who gobbled down men in Book 9 of the Odyssey and ripping them limb from limb to fix his meal, he bolted them down like a mountain lion, left no scrap, devoured entrails, flesh and bones, marrow and all. Those are the lines from Homer. But here in Ovid, he's looking at himself in a pool, trying to manipulate his features to look less scary. So before we turn to his awful song, we have to remember that the character of the Cyclops is more than just a brute. He was also perceived as embodying blasphemy. He's a godless character. So the boorishness of Polyphemus has an unholy dimension. His self-absorption is part of that godlessness. So the other thing to notice in this song of course, is how you can't really alter your true nature, as we're going to see as he slowly devolves away from romance. The song begins with the praise of the beauty of Galatea. Whiter than snowy petals of privet, my fair Galatea. Richer in bloom than the meadows. More slender and tall than the alder. Sparkling as crystal glass. So we get the picture. We are going to compare this section of Ovid to the wisdom of Socrates as expressed in Plato's Lysis Dialogue. And in the lachrymose beginning of the giant song, I'm reminded how Socrates said to his infatuated friend Hypothales, if you have ever made any verses or songs in honor of your favorites, I do not want to hear them. But in this ode to the beauty of Galatea, Socrates would argue that while the Cyclops is directing his affection towards Galatea, he is in very truth honoring himself. Socrates says, it is you to whom these songs refer. That's what he says to Hypothales. It is you to whom these songs refer, as in not to his beloved. For if you prevail on your favorite, all that you have spoken and sung will be so much glory to you and a veritable eulogy upon your triumph. But the Cyclops soon begins to say things that do not recommend themselves to us men for imitation in our own pursuits, for I would not expect a modern woman to be impressed if I told her she was softer than curdled milk. But there's a shift in the poem. After he says this line, that Galatea is more lush than a beautiful garden, if only you wouldn't avoid me, is what he says. Now, I wonder if that really just means that all of his praise is only truly given on the condition of her positive requital. For from that line on, the song takes a harsher tone, and he calls her wilder than an untamed heifer. And then seeming to work himself up into anger at her denials, he goes on to call her more vicious and cruel than a trampled snake. More vicious and cruel than a trampled snake. If you really think about that line. The Cyclops is so barbaric that he believes he should expect goodwill from the very thing he has trampled. And in the next line, the power that I wish above all I could take away from your nature, the fleetness of foot to outpace the baying pack, as in the baying pack of dogs. So as he's praising her attributes, he reveals that he also wishes he could diminish them, chiefliest 
that one witch allows her to flee from him. But the funniest part of this section comes when the Cyclops tries to convince Galatea that he isn't gruesome to look at. He starts by badly invoking the great philosophical proverb. He says, truly, I know myself. I recently saw my reflection in pure, clear water and liked the image that met my gaze. Look at my massive size. And continuing, we get this godless blasphemy when he says, Great Jupiter, high in the heavens, has in a larger frame in the tale you people keep telling some Jove or other is reigning up there. So he's saying that he is of a greater size than a deity that he has neither seen nor credits but esteems himself superior, not to the god himself, apparently, he doesn't believe in him, but surpassing even of Galatea's imagined notion of the ruler of heaven. His earthly size, he reckons, is grander than what he deems to be the puny limits of spirituality. It gets better as he goes on about his appearance. Don't think me ugly, he says, because my body's a bristling thicket of prickly hair. A tree is ugly without any foliage. So is a horse. It could be worse, honey. I could look like a shaved horse. So I've only one eye on my brow, he says. But that is big. Now, some of this story Ovid has taken from Theocritus, the Greek pastoral poet, who deals with the pining Cyclops in his Idyll 11. And there the detail is added that the Cyclops also has but one nostril. But for all his attempts at romance, we will see that he's the same brute, because he can't help but revert to the monster he is when he thinks about Galatea's lover Asus. Let chance bring him my way, and he'll soon discover the giant's strength. I'll draw his guts from his living body, then tear it to pieces and scatter his limbs all over the fields. So those are the flaws of the Cyclops. He can't be anything other than the monster that he is. But Galatea is not the brightest bulb herself, to judge from her reaction to this outburst. She tells us what he does once his song is over. The Cyclops finished his futile lament. I was watching and saw him rise and keep on the move as he stumped his way through the well-known pastures and woods like a frantic bull deprived of his cow. So he's raging about like an animal in the moments before he will kill Asus. But stupid Galatea, notwithstanding that she can clearly see how angry the Cyclops is, she says... Asus and I were entirely unready for what happened next. The Cyclops sees the two of them and yells, I can see you and I'll make certain that this is the last of your loving encounters. And Galatea, suddenly unconcerned for her boyfriend, says, My own response was to dive straight into the sea, leaving her bow behind to get crushed by a rock that the Cyclops throws at him while he's running around crying for help. So what trait ties all of these three characters together? If we read our Seneca, it is the feeling of self-love. That the lovers did not expect the violence of the Cyclops is a sign of complacent self-love. And the link between failing to foresee the harms done to us and excessive self-love is discussed by Seneca. He writes, Men judge some happenings to be unjust because they did not deserve them, some merely because they did not expect them. Seneca continues, this in turn is due to excessive self-love. We decide that we ought not to be harmed even by our enemies. So Seneca would have said this regarding the anger of the Cyclops. What is there surprising in wicked men's practicing wicked deeds? So the lesson in Ovid and Seneca then is that if we let our egos swell too much, that we might even believe that fortune ought not dare to do us harm, and if it ought not, then we will think it will not. And the consequence of such an attitude is that even when we are well aware of those wicked agents who cause harm, it can only be our ego which convinces us that we are impervious to their schemes and will be all the more likely to suffer injustice if we make no effort to avoid it or if we are too foolish to see it coming.